Next, we have a, we have a, a local Ann Arbor presentation um, from Ramon. And let me see if I can uh, get this queued up. Um, oh, and it's got, for those in the room, it's, it's, it's a hands-on presentation. Um, doo -doo -doo. All right. So what I wanted to say is uh, Ramon is the MicroCT lab manager at uh, UMM2. Is that what you UMMZ. wrote here? UMMZ. UMMZ. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's been using Dragonfly back since 2019. He learned about it at a, at a Tosca conference. A couple of you, uh, we were talking about the Tosca conference um, uh, at breakfast this morning. So uh, Ramon, um, take it away. Tell us about, uh, about the, uh, the museum perspective on Dragonfly. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Mike. Uh, and thank you, ORS and Dragonfly. This has been a great conference, I've learned quite a bit. And I'm really excited actually to talk to you all today a bit about CT scanning in the context of a natural history museum. And as Mike mentioned, I work at the UMMZ, we're about three miles from here. And um, just really quick before I keep going, so those 3D prints that are going around, one of them is a snake fang. Um, and we actually set it up to be able to deliver venom. Uh, so check it out when it gets to you. So. Before I go too far, I just want to sort of talk a little bit about what a natural history museum is. So natural history museums can be defined in all kinds of different ways, but to me, the simplest way to define them is that they are scientific institutions that record the Earth's biodiversity and its history. This is accomplished through the creation and curation of scientific collections of specimens from all around the world. These specimens are vouchered, um, and then they are used for research and public engagement. Museums can serve a number of different purposes. Um, so in one way, they can act as a time capsule for biodiversity. So for example, we can make collections from one particular uh, locality. So perhaps a collection of like mice was made from a swamp 100 years ago. And then we can look at those mice again in the modern day, or at least look at collections of specimens from that locality in the modern day. And we can try and understand how these taxa have changed or the species compositions have changed in relation to things like climate change, as well as human uh, encroachment. And we can make predictions about where and how biodiversity might change through time and uh, in geographic, geographical senses. From an evolutionary biology perspective, science, uh, natural history collections can serve as important resources for morphological and molecular data that can be used in taxonomic, uh, phylogenetic, and biomedical biomechanical studies as well. They can allow us to understand where there are uh, biodiversity hotspots and cold spots around the world. We can try and figure out why some species are so speciose and why others are not. And kind of to me, one of the most important roles of a natural history museum is that they can serve as a lot of people's first contact with the natural world. So think back uh, perhaps to when you were a kid you walked into a museum, you saw a Tyrannosaurus Rex for the first time, a mammoth, a whale. That moment of awe, I think, is something that a natural history museum can really convey better than a lot of other places that you can visit. So really, the goals of a natural history museum can kind of be broadly summed in two ways. First, they are to uh, to accomplish the long-term preservation of the vouchered specimens. So anything we do collect, we want to ensure that they are around forever. These specimens that are put in alcohol, on shelves, et cetera, we want to ensure that people have access to them you know, for the next 100, 1,000, basically forever uh, years. We want to also ensure that those collections can be used for research and education purposes. So we want to be able to use those taxa to understand our world and then convey that knowledge to the general public. And this is where CT scanning comes in. And I think CT scanning actually fits perfectly in with the overarching goals of a natural history museum. The primary reason, as we saw in that last talk, is that CT scanning is non-destructive. So the non-destructive nature of CT scanning allows us to collect all kinds of morphological data uh, about the specimens in our collection without having to cut into them, dissect them, skeletonize them, for example. We can literally keep a specimen that we collected in the field, in its jar, in as close to a situation as it would have existed in life as well. 
CT data, of course, is, is very data rich. There's a lot of information we can get from a CT scan. But not only do we get the CT data, but there's this idea in the museum community now of the super specimen. So when a specimen is collected in the field, scientists may now be taking uh, behavioral data prior to actually taking the specimen. Um, they'll collect things like uh, geographical data, molecular. Oh, wow. <laughs> molecular data, uh, so we'll take tissue samples, and by adding CT data into that mix, we're able to create uh, things like a super specimen. So I'm not sure, if, do I have a pointer somewhere? Um, anyways, you can see that kind of mosaic picture on the bottom. Um, that shows you kind of the range of things that we can capture using CT data, and then in total add that to the utility of any one single specimen. And finally, going back, uh, oh, they're also good for public outreach, as you are all engaging right now with some CT data, or former CT data, in the form of those 3D prints. I'm going to yeah. interrupt you just yeah. for a second to unmute uh -oh. the audio so that oh, I see. the room audio has stopped streaming, okay. but we're gonna, the, this microphone is going to be picking you up. Okay. Laser pointer? Oh, yeah, thank you. No problem. All right. So the Zoom audience can hear us again for now. Okay. Did they miss any? Should we go back? Um, the, the YouTube capture from the room okay. uh, will be good. All right. But, uh, sorry for that. <laughs> Not a problem. It's all right. Um, and so, sorry, yeah. So just to kind of go back to that one point, CT data, it's non-destructive, great for our specimens. Um, it's data rich. It contributes to very large, uh, complete data sets for our specimens. Um, also allows us to do really incredible things in terms of public engagement. Um, and then finally, CT data is a future-proof kind of data collection method for museum collections. Because as I mentioned, we want to ensure that these specimens are kept for you know, the long term and that we don't do something to them today that might preclude um, you know, future research activities that we cannot predict today. And I can say that with complete confidence because I know for a fact that when some people were collecting, you know, little mice in a field near here 150 years ago, they had no idea that we'd be sticking them in a scanner and then 3D printing them. So this brings me to the UMMZ. This is where I work. Um, so the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology is our primary collections and research space. The University of Michigan can get a little confusing with its museums because we have a museum system. Down the street is the Natural History Museum. That's sort of our public face. Um, we are the kind of behind the scenes, where we're all kind of the research and specimens are held. We are one of the largest collections um, actually on Earth. Um, so in terms of herpetological collections, we are the largest university collection um, globally. Um, amongst collections worldwide, as you can see on, on there, we are, we are pretty massive. So we have some incredible holdings. If you are interested in studying you know, certain taxonomic groups, feel free to visit us. Oh, you want to take a picture of that? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, um, and one of the really, really unique things with our museum is that we have our micro CT scanner. Thanks, Josh. Um, this scanner is less than 50 feet away from our collections. So a lot of other museums have to package their specimens, send them out to places. They've got to take them across campus. Um, I think the University of Florida literally has to go through a small rainforest uh, from their collections to their CT scanner. But for us, it's literally, it, it's probably no further away than the exit door is from where I'm standing right now. Since 2018, we've conducted over 7,000 specimen scans. This accounts for about 5,500 species from our collection alone. We have around 100 terabytes of data. On an average day, we're doing about 12 to 15 specimen scans. So this doesn't necessarily mean 12 to 15 species. Sometimes we're doing whole body and head scans. And then we're also doing dice CT scans as well. We've scanned fossils and archaeological samples as well. And we are now a core facility. And I'll come, come back to that. So just a few cool things to point out. The biggest thing we have CT scanned in our machine was a red fox. Um, the smallest thing we actually scanned was a uh, little uh, barb from a cone snail, so highly venomous little animal. Uh, but one of the coolest small things we've CT scanned, and because I wanted to show off what I learned yesterday, uh, is this wasp. So uh, thank you, Eric Fournier, for showing us how to do the virtual floors. I did that last night right after the talk. Um, so you should all do it. It's really easy. Uh, so I won't go over our um, 
our kind of process because this should be familiar to everyone here. One thing that I do want to note is that when we do put specimens in the scanner, we're extremely careful to ensure that the specimens are protected from desiccation. If you've ever worked with a CT scanner, they can get warm. So we ensure that our fluid preserved specimens at least are packed in heat sealed bags so that they do not warm up and essentially dry out while they're in scan. Most of our scans are about 15 minutes long, um, but occasionally we do run longer scans, so we want to ensure that the specimens are not damaged or destroyed. Again, I'm not going to talk about segmentation, but I am going to point out some of the resources that we have available for our students. This is just on the other side of the building from our CT scanner. It's like a two minute walk. And all of the students that come and work with us are trained in A, how to use the scanner, and then B, how to engage in kind of the CT data analysis. So we train them uh, to use Dragonfly, amongst other segmentation software, um, as well as work with programs such as Blender to produce 3D prints, such as the ones you're working on. A lot of the 3D prints that you're all working on were student made. Um, they're made for a large outreach project we recently had. Um, but what's really cool about this facility is that they can just use their regular University of Michigan logins to get on this. There's no uh, extra kind of layers of protection here. They can just come in as long as they work with us, they can get a project. The overall goal for all of our students uh, when they come to work with us is that eventually they will get to the point where they can conduct a research project and get a publication. And we actually have a couple of students, undergraduate students who have publications pending now from CT data that they have worked with. We also have specialized in DICE CT. So we've been doing a lot of this uh, type of scanning. So if, for those of you who are not familiar, DICE CT scanning uh, basically is a protocol by which you stain your specimens, you increase kind of the density of the soft tissue structures, and then you're able to visualize things such as uh, musculature, neural, uh, neural anatomy. And we've really spent a lot of time thinking about this because as I said, you know, one of our overarching goals is not to damage or destroy the specimen. So we've really figured out how to make this as reverse as possible and as uh, minimally impactful for specimens as possible. And of course, we're making sure that we share all of this. So we're really, really big on if we do something new, we do something unique, and we improve upon an existing process, we're putting that data out there, we're showing everyone exactly how to do it. Because a lot of times in the museum community, people are conservative. They don't really want to you know, do something to their specimens that might damage or destroy them. So we want to make sure like, if we're doing something and we know we can do it with confidence, um, we share that information out. And we have done hundreds and hundreds of dice CT scans without destroying or damaging a specimen. Like everyone in this room, we have data management problems too, um, but we are trying our best to be as transparent with our data as possible. Of course, we're a museum and museums, part of our goal is to act as a resource for the scientific community. So a lot of our data is actually available now on Morphosource and Deep Blue data. So for those of you that don't know what Morphosource is, um, it's a repository run by Duke University. Um, it was part of the Overt Project, which I'll come back to, and there are thousands upon thousands of data sets on that website that are freely available for research purposes. And we are actually working now <clears throat> on our own repository here at Michigan called Deep Blue. Uh, what we're going to be doing with Deep Blue is actually linking the data there back to our catalogs. So if you can, if you go to the catalog, you'll see links towards uh, CT data sets and back uh, from Deep Blue data. Just want to kind of broadly go over a few of the research projects that are happening here at Michigan uh, at at U UMMC. Um, so in Dr. Dan Roboski's lab, they're using CT scanning to study limb reduction in skinks. And actually, if you want to know more about this, talk to Natasha. That's literally her PhD. She's an expert on it. Um, Dr. Allison Davis Roboski in her lab, we're looking at snake neural neural anatomy. We're going to see a couple pictures of that in a few moments, as well as venom gland delivery systems. In Hernan's lab, they're looking at kind of the evolution and, and kind of diversity of jaw structures in fish, um, which are incredible. In Cody's uh, group, um, it's, there's several research projects, but the main thing that's really going on are these two big scanning efforts. So a, there's the Funky project and the Bat Pen project. Basically, for both of these groups, we're scanning every rodent and every bat and making those data available via uh, Morphosource and other repositories. I just want to touch quickly on OVERT. Uh, for any of you that don't know about what this project is or was, um, it was an NSF-funded multi-institutional scanning effort. Basically, um, the collections in university museums uh, shown above 
we all got together, we were on this big grant, and essentially we, the goal was to CT scan a representative species of all extant vertebrate taxa. Um, and we got, pre, we got far into that. We got about 22,000 species done. Those data are now available on Morphosource. And University of Michigan, uh, we were lucky enough to be one of the five CT scanning institutions. So my first couple of years here, I was just getting loan after loan from our partner museums of all kinds of incredible taxa. And again, those data are up and available online. So, just to kind of take a quick look at a few of the projects, as I mentioned, we're looking at snake neural anatomy. We're not just looking at things like garter snakes, we're actually looking across the snake tree and then looking at kind of how uh, the neurology of these taxa have changed. And that's just probably something I want to talk about with deep learning or explore with deep learning because these brains are remarkably consistent. If it's something we can do, I'd love to love to talk to anyone about it who has got ideas. Um, we're also looking at snake venom delivery systems. So they're looking at the morphology of the actual venom glands and then pairing what that morphology uh, looks like with the protein sequences that they can get out of them. We're looking at the cardiopulmonary system in bats. So here we can see these are actually two different bats. So we have a Artebius uh, jamaicensis, a Jamaican fruit bat, as well as a uh, brown bat here. And you can see the heart and lung structure of this animal. And they have incredibly huge hearts for their body size. If you can imagine, if you've ever seen a bat fly, it's like they're screaming through the air kind of thing, like just flapping their wings incredibly crazy. So they've got this incredible cardiovascular system. We also, and I want to take a look at this, and sorry, Carl, I gave you a heads up about the coiled snakes. Um, here we have this specimen. What's really cool about this that I want to point out that CT scanning has really helped us with is that this specimen was collected as just part of an ecological survey. There was no dietary information associated with the specimen, but when we CT scanned it, we were uh, quite pleased to discover that there was a frog inside of its gut. And so, you know, without CT scanning, we would have probably only discovered this by basically cutting the specimen open. So now we have this incredible specimen, which is really representative of like ecology in a bottle, uh, where we can see what it ate. And then as a primer for the next slide, you can also see some eggs inside of this specimen. So eggs are pretty cool, right? Except when you get some species that give birth to live young, and you can actually take a look at their vertebral uh, like basically <laughs> developing young. So this is a Cisturus, this is a Massasauga rattler, which actually lives around here. So if you're in the long grass, especially right now, it's kind of warm, um, you might see these. Um, but you can see here, we can count the young, um, you can do all kinds of things. So you can learn about reproductive ecology really, really easily using CT data. And again, virtual florists, I'm gonna use these all the time in my talks. <laughs> And then finally, looking at fish anatomy. I'm not an ichthyologist myself, but I do work with our ichthyologists, and they're doing some incredible things, looking at neural, neural anatomy, looking at swim bladder anatomy, as well as jaw structures and the associated uh, musculature with that. If you think fish are boring, you are very wrong. They're absolutely incredible, and I thought fish were boring. They have absolutely wild morphologies and incredible anatomy. So you can take a look at them with CT as well. So just kind of uh, one little plug here. We are now a core facility as well. Uh, I, there are a number of core facilities on campus. We're kind of the newest CT core to jump in. Uh, just one thing, I mean, I have all the information here. If anyone's interested, you can chat with me after my talk. But I do want to make one note about scanning UMMZ specimens. So because we treat the specimens uh, or, or the CT data as facsimiles of the actual specimens themselves. We do ask that when people use uh, UMMZ accession specimens and CT scan them for their projects, that those data be made available on uh, Deep Blue Data or another repository um, as a part of a user agreement. Um, however, we don't need to put them up right away. If people are interested in doing research projects, you know, we can hold data off until you've published etc. But we do eventually require that. Um, and nowadays, a lot of journals require that you put your CT data up online somewhere. And so we'll do it for you for free um, and give you a DOI for your publications. And so yeah, if you, you're interested in this, please chat with me afterwards and feel free to come and scan at the UMMZ. So just in closing, CT data and natural history museums really, really go hand in hand. Uh, CT data provides a wealth of information, especially morphological and anatomical information that can be gathered without destroying our specimens, which is critical. Uh, we can create these super specimen records, which have data from morphology, molecular behavior, et cetera. 
The data, of course, are easily shareable via data repositories. They can make for uh, a really, really great training tool. We have students starting in our lab who have no idea what anatomy is. Like, that's it. They're just like, well, I've got an arm. You know, they just know they're interested in animals. And using CT data, they can learn the basics of comparative anatomy and then come out of there with publications. And they know their systems up and down because they spend time looking at them with segmentation software. And then finally, as I think you've all seen today, they provide a really great resource for outreach and engagement. Because, you know, how many of you have ever held a venom or a snake fang before? So, anyways, with that. I just want to thank some of my colleagues and collaborators at the UMMZ and University of Michigan and a few other places, and thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ramon. It's it's uh, it's very refreshing to see a new perspective. You know, the uh, you, what you tell us about the the mission of the museum, maybe it should be obvious to us, but it's, it's so different in many ways from right. the, the research mission of research labs or even industry production labs where a lot of us come from. So it's a very refreshing take and uh, it's exciting to see the work you do. Um, I don't think we're gonna have any questions from the Zoom audience for this one, right. um, but I do wanna see who, in the, uh, who here in the audience has any questions for Ramon uh, at this time. I, I, was say, I, I, was, I was about to throw in my question when the audience didn't have any, but all right, let's, uh, let's start with Natalie. Yeah. Okay, so you, you indicated that the size of the specimen should not exceed 22 centimeters yeah, that's in kind either of our, direction. I think it's, yeah, Josh, it's about 22 centimeters is the, is the cabinet for, yeah, so it's pretty much like a cube of about 22 so centimeters. So even if you stitch multiple Well, centimeters. we could, yeah, so we could stitch, yeah, so like, so in a single scan, basically. So how much does the, the machine take? Uh, What's the vertical throw? So I did fit a whole red, an entire dead red fox in, so oh. that big. About, it fit in a five gallon bucket. Um, so. uh, about 17 inches yeah, there is we the go. total vertical travel yeah. of the machine. Okay. Josh set us up, so. Hmm. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then I think, uh, Josh. Was that, did that answer your question? Okay, and then I think you had a question, Josh? Just wanted to make sure someone had a comment. That okay. Was a oh. Great, great presentation. <laughs> oh, thanks, Josh. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Ron. Thanks, thanks again. Thank you very much.